I welcome you all uh, to the first lecture of a course titled Psychology of Emotion Theory and Applications. So, as you know, uh, this is a course associated with the discipline of psychology, and more specifically, we will be talking about the concept of emotion. The diverse aspects of emotion we will be talking about, including uh, the theoretical aspects and specific applications, also, we will talk about it. So, uh, before basically I talk about what this course is all about, since this is a course associated with the discipline of psychology, uh, I will give you a brief background uh, about the discipline of psychology, because there may be many students who will be taking this course, uh, no, who are outside the, who, who, who are you know, not from the background of psychology discipline. So, it is better to give some background, so that you know, whoever comes to this course who are not from the discipline of psychology have some understanding of what this discipline is all about. So, very briefly I will define what psychology is all about. Now, one of the basic definition of psychology here you can see is that it is as a scientific psychology is science or scientific study of behavior and mental processes. So, if you look at this definition, uh, there are few things that we need to understand. Uh, one is that it is you know science or scientific study. Another term that we need to understand is behavior, another term is called as mental processes. Now, these two, three terms we need to understand just to uh, uh, get an idea of what this discipline is all about. So, the first thing is that uh, psychology is, is a science or it includes scientific study. What does, what is the meaning of science or scientific study? So, that is very important to understand. So, any discipline can be called as science or scientific study provided it uses scientific method. So, what method or methodology is used by a discipline that determines whether this can be called as a science or not. So, science does not mean just only you know uh, pure sciences like you know physics, chemistry or biology, science can be social sciences also. So, psychology is called science or scientific study. What does science or scientific study basically means? It basically means it uses scientific method. Now, in scientific method, to call something a scientific method, there are certain hallmarks or characteristics of scientific method. So, in this slide, you can see some of the characteristics of scientific method. When we say that a particular discipline is science or I am using a scientific study, the idea is that this discipline or this particular study or experiment is following or having these characteristics or these hallmarks. So, one of the thing that is uh, there in the scientific method is that you know that it uses systematic observation or empiricism. Systematic observation. So, the one of the basic characteristics of science is that you know it uses systematic observation as one of the aspects of his method. What does that mean? So, science will study only those phenomena which can be observed or detected using our sense organs. So, science will not study anything beyond which cannot be detected you know uh, beyond detection. So, whatever we can detect using our sense organ like you know, you know hearing, seeing, touching, tasting, smelling and so on. Now, scientific method does not only uh, you know e uses observation, it also uses systematic observation. So, that is very important. Systematic observation basically means what? We can observe something randomly or we can observe something systematically. So, there is a difference between these two terms. We can just observe something randomly here and there and make conclusion and such conclusion can be erroneous or error or uh, full of error. Why? For example, let us take some human behavior as an example. So, you go to a shop and you meet a salesman for the first time and that salesman behaves very strangely or rudely to use, let us say. Immediately, you will like to conclude that this is a very rude person, but if you clearly think about it, it is just one instance of behavior of that person. It is a random observation, just you came for the first time you are meeting that person and randomly observe one instance of his behavior. It may be because this person is rude today because of something happened in his life or some quarrel, some conflict has happened. So, it is he is in the disturbed mode probably that is influencing his behavior probably most of the time this person is calm and well behaved. So, if I make a conclusion based on just one observation, then uh, that this person is a rude person, probably 
most likely that uh, my conclusion may be wrong. So, science says you need to do systematic observation, many instances of observation, collection of data of different you know, set uh, different time points and so on, so that you can make a, you know, a confident conclusion that you know it is most likely to happen that this phenomena is likely to happen or something like this. So, systematic observation is very important in scientific method, we should not make conclusion based on just few instances of observation or random observation, then those things could be by chance only, not necessarily it is a part of that phenomena. So, systematic observation is very important, which is also technically called as empiricism or empirical study, where you collect data systematically and then you know you make conclusions based on those observations. So, this is one important thing. Second characteristics of scientific study is that you know objectivity. Objectivity is something very important to science because if you objectivity basically means that you know you are not using biases, your own subjective biases, your own individual biases in interpreting something or collection of data or interpretation of data. So, when you are biased, so you may think that something should happen then you are kind of you know manipulating data and trying to show that this is how things happens, but it is a biased data. It may not give you the accurate or actual uh, you know reality of that phenomena. So, objectivity means you just keep aside all your biases, whatever you think, whatever you feel should, should be kept aside and look at the phenomena as it is and collect and you know report that. So, that is the meaning of objectivity. Subjectivity is just opposite, you, you just you know kind of uh, you know whatever you feel like, whatever you think you are just you know, you know reporting that. So, that is subjectivity, it changes from time to time, place to place. Objectivity is more factual. So, science uses objectivity as one of its method, part of its characteristics of the method. The third important characteristics of science is called as replicability or verifiability. So, this is also very important. In uh, the scientific community or if you see any discipline, there are journals where you know uh, people keep publishing their experimental dot studies and you know whatever experiments they do, whatever studies they do. Why these are published? The idea is to verify, to replicate, so that others can also replicate the same thing or can comment on it whether uh, you know this is true or not. If you have done an experiment you found using certain methodology and found a result and no one else is follow finding the same result using the same methodology, then there is something questionable. You are only finding others are not finding. So, that means there is something problem in your findings. So, replicability and verifiability when something is verified again and again replicated again and again, then you are much more confident that something is true or actually this is a phenomena that is happening because it is not my own study, there are many other people have found the similar thing. So, that is called replicability or verifiability. So, these are some of the, there are many other characteristics, but these are some of the prime or major characteristics of scientific method. To call a discipline as science or a study as scientific, this characteristic should be followed uh, to call something as science. So, the idea of when we call psychology as science or scientific study, the idea is psychology is trying to maintain these parameters or these characteristics in their studies. Uh, so, that is the one idea called scientific study. Uh, now, behaviors, so science psychology is the scientific study of behaviors. Behaviors means what? In psychology, we use the term behaviors to mean observable actions which can be measured. So, whatever actions that can be observed are called as behaviors. So, for example, I am, if I walk here, you can observe the movement of my body. If I say something, you can record what is being said here. So, all these are called behaviors because they can be observed and recorded and measured. Okay? So, psychology studies human behavior and mental processes. Now, the mental processes basically include, it is a broad term which includes many things like you know the, the diverse activities of mind are collectively can be called as mental processes. So, activities of mind, there are diverse activities for example, you know the concept of perception, thinking, memory, imagination and so on and so on. So, mind does all these activities and uh, these are all also studied using scientific method in the psychology. Okay. So, they try to quantify what is going on in your mind using 
certain methodological aspects. So, we will not go into details of all these things because this is not the focus of this course. So, the psychology is a scientific study of human behavior and mental processes. So, we try to understand what is scientific study, what is behavior, what is mental processes. So, the idea is psychology tries to holistically understand the diverse aspect of human behavior and we can understand it is a very complex subject. Understanding human human behavior is a very complex thing. So, psychology has many sub disciplines which tries to address the diverse aspects uh, you know because one the discipline as a whole everybody cannot study everything about a discipline. So, all discipline has sub disciplines with the idea that uh, that few people will focus on particular aspects other people will focus on some other aspects. This is how sub disciplines arises within a discipline. So, like this uh, the psychology as a discipline has many sub disciplines. It, it has uh, sub disciplines like social psychology uh, know, which looks at social behavior. Uh, it, it has also disciplines like you know clinical sub disciplines like clinical psychology which lo looks at you know mental disorders you know uh, then uh, treatments and so on and so on uh, diagnosis all these things. Psychology also has health psychology which also looks at how mental factors influences physical health and so on. It has also organizational behavior it also looks at how people behave in the organization and so on. So, uh, psychology has diverse uh, sub disciplines and all the sub discipline focuses on different aspects of human behavior. Uh, with the idea to understand uh, human behavior from the multiple perspectives. Now, let us come to this particular course. So, one thing is very clear this is a course associated with the discipline of psychology. Now, the concept of emotion is the central focus of this course. So, we will try to understand the concept of emotion. Now, when we talk about emotion it is it is one of the central concept of psychology. If you look at any sub disciplines of psychology you cannot you know the emotion will come again and again into the picture. Because we cannot understand human beings without the concept of emotions. The emotion is one thing that makes human life so different, so rich in terms of experiences. It is what differentiate us from a machine, you know. Machine can do lot of activities, but at least for the time being we do not know a machine that can feel and has emotions. So, this emotion is something one of the central aspect of human behavior. So, if you look at social psychology, you cannot understand social behavior without understanding emotions and relationships, how it plays out. We cannot understand clinical psychology without understanding emotions because all the psychological disorders has emotions in it as one of the central concept. Uh, so, like this, uh, so this is very important concepts to understand human beings, to understand psychology, this is uh, really a signi significant topic. So, that is what uh, we will be doing in this course, understand this concept from through the discipline of psychology and some associated disciplines, what have we understood about this concept of emotion, both in terms of theories as well as applications. So, this course will provide a comprehensive understanding and applications of the psychology of emotions and we will also look at application of emotion using the term emotional intelligence also. So, broadly if you see all the content of this course, th we can divide it into two parts. One is you know uh, majorly the fa first part of this course deals with the theoretical aspects of emotion. So, it talks about theoretical understanding of diverse aspects of emotions and the concept of emotion. Uh, the last part of this course uh, typically will deal with uh, application of emotion using particularly, particularly using the concept of emotional intelligence. So, this course will address uh, some of the major questions that are as associated with the scientific study of emotions. So, these questions you can see these are very important to understand our own life as well as to understand uh, the discipline of psychology also and to understand human behavior. So, we will deal with questions such as what are emotions, we will also talk about are these emotions universal or are there culture specific emotions, is it like emotions are universally is, you know in a similar way experienced by everybody in every culture or there are some culture specific, specific aspects to it, we will address this question. We will also look at how uh, emotions influence our brain and body. So, the physiological aspects of emotion we will also discuss in this course, how emo when we experience emotion, how it is related to physiology, how it influences your body, your brain and so on and so on. We will also uh, talk about what happens when we are not able to manage emotions. So, management of emotion is very important. So, what happens when we are not able to manage emotion, how it leads to probably lead, uh, lead to various uh, disorders and you know sufferings in life. We will also talk about are there emotion based psychological disorders, uh, wh what are 
are there any specific you know disorders which are focus central aspect of such disorders are you know emotions or lack of or inability to manage emotion can lead to various psychological disorders uh, we will look into these aspects uh, we will also address can we learn to regulate destructive emotions particularly some emotions can be very harmful for us so can we learn to regulate those emotions what are positive emotions and happiness this is also very important we will not only talk about only negative emotions so there are positive emotions which are very important for the qual enhancing quality of our life so we will try to understand what is happiness what are positive emotions and can we enhance those positive emotions in our life to you know make our life in, in, in terms of quality of our life to enhance the quality of our life we will also talk about what is emotional intelligence why it is so important for success and satisfaction in our personal and professional life so we we'll look at the concept of emotional intelligence is coming in a very big way and uh, the research has been looking at it and uh, and found that it is very important for the you know happiness and satisfaction and success in your personal as well as professional life so we we'll look into the diverse aspect of emotional intelligence and we'll also see can we learn these skills in our life to enhance the quality of our life so overall you can see this course will provide a comprehensive insights insightful understanding of the emotions through examination of both theoretical and empirical literature on this subject so we'll look into this so it will not be just like layman concept that i will give my own opinions no this will be through research based theories and data that we'll be talking about all these concepts so overall this course is a 12 week course uh, uh, there will be 12 modules one module each each week and there will be probably two to three lectures per module so maybe in total there will be 30 32 lectures so this is how we'll go in this course so this is the first lecture of first module uh, and the title of this lecture is emotion concepts and categories okay so what are the key concepts that we'll be discussing in this lecture so these are the key concepts that we'll be discussing in today's lecture so we'll talk about definition and components of emotions how do you define emotion then we'll talk about uh, what is what are the differences between the concept of effect emotions and moods Many times these terms are synonymously used, but there are uh, technical differences to these terms. So, we will look into the differences among these terms. Then we will also talk about how emotions can be understood or classified using two categories of theories. One is called basic emotional model, where they try to look at some basic emotions and also through dimensional model of emotions. So, these are the things that we will be covering in today's lecture. So, let us uh, start with the core component concepts of this particular lecture so as we have already said that you know from the scientific standpoint or even from the layman standpoint emotion is a central topic within the field of psychology as well as within the life of every human beings every day we experience diverse emotions we cannot think or imagine human life without emotions you know it is the emotion that gives you all the richness of experiences all the ups and downs and all the you know all the diverse experiences which makes our life so enriched uh, so it is the emotion that is central to all these aspects as we have already said that all the subdisciplines of psychology emotion is you know at the center of almost every subdisciplines of psychology for example, clinical psychologists often help people to control their harmful or dysfunctional emotions. So, clinical psychologists fo major focus is on emotions only, you know. It is the emotional disturbances that cause all the problems. So, the focus of clinical psychology is understanding emotions and also, you know, treating people if there are problems with the emotions. Cognitive psychologists consider how emotion influence people's thought processes and decisions. Emotions are not just isolated you know they we experience them in an isolated way they also influences our thought processes so we we'll look into how this happens social psychologist personality theorist uh, considers how emotion impact our relationship with others and so on so it is just to show how important this topic is and i don't have to you know give you too much of evidence for this we all understand even if you see or contemplate on our personal life so let us let us start with the first questions what are emotions to understand emotions first we need to understand what is this emotion is all about okay then we can talk about other things 
So, let us first address these questions. So, every day we experience diverse emotions on a daily basis, you know, we become angry, sad, we experience, you know, whatever contempt, whatever it is, you know, all kinds of emotion we experience every day. We all have experienced it, we all know it, we all have a sense of it. Okay. So, it is easy to understand all these emotions, kind of we can recognize all this emotion within us when it happens, uh, but it is not so easy to define it actually. We can sense it that it, when we experience it, we, we kind of understand or learn from others how to name it also, but it is not easy to define it what it is because it can be very complex in terms of really com giving a comprehensive definition of it. In fact, one published research review found 92 separate definitions of emotions. So, it just shows how people can, you know, have diverse ideas about the concept of emotions, you know. Uh, so, this led to some researcher even say something like, you know, everyone knows what it is means what emotion is until they are asked to define it. We all know what emotion is, we all experience it, we all sense it, we all feel it every day. Uh, but uh, if you ask them what emotion is, it is difficult to define. Yeah. So, we all know it until one is asked to define it. So, that basically shows the complexity and difficulty in defining a complex concept such as emotion. One of the language amazing qualities is its ability to refer to things even when you do not know exactly what we mean. So, this is one of the qualities of human ability you can say in terms of ability of language is that we somehow are able to define something even we may not exactly know what it is you know. So, that is the ability of human language. So, people anyway try to define emotion in, in their own way. So, we will look into few or only uh, important definition of emotion which is kind of little bit more comprehensive definition and this is how we will go about it. So, the word emotion basically uh, came from a uh, source word is a Latin word uh, is emotio, you know this is the term uh, which comes from this verb word emovery, from emovery comes the emotio which basically means to move or to stir up. So, that is the term that is the source term of the word emotion. So, the source term of emotion basically means anything that moves you. So, emotion moves you, it stirs you up. So, whenever we feel any emotions, it is a tendency to move you, to stir you up. You are no longer just you know in a state where there is no kind of movement. You know? So, there is a sense of movement, there is a sense of stirring up happens. So, Aristotle also said emotions as a principle of movement in human experience. So, we move in life, one of the reason is that it is the emotion that moves us in our life, you know. So, that is a source term. So, anyway, so despite, you know, difficulty in precisely defining this concept of emotion, uh, most psychologists agrees on some of the basic aspects of the emotion and based on that, I just took one definition where it kind of includes uh, most of the parameters which are included in most of the definitions. So, one of the definition could be emotion is a motivated state. So, it says state where you know you it kind of propels you to move. So, it is a motivated state and what is the characteristics of that state? This state is marked by physiological arousal, excessive expressive behavior and mental experiences. So, these are the three component of uh, emotional state and all these things I know can vary in their intensity and was and uh, as well as pleasantness or unpleasantness you know. So, what happens is a state where it is there are physiological arousal, there is an expressive behavior and there is a mental experiences. All these things can vary in their intensity. So, it can be very high or low or medium or it could also vary in their pleasantness or unpleasantness. So, it could be experienced very pleasant way, it could feel very good or it may feel very bad or negative. So, one of the example that is also given here, let us say when we feel anger, angry, we, we are in a state of anger which is an emotion, emotional state. So, 
physiologically what happens when we feel angry our heart beat increases so that's a physiological arousal okay your heart beat increases so physiological arousal is happening here when you are angry we also might show specific facial expression you know such as a gritting teeth so whenever people feel angry you know they show certain facial expression like you know they will grit teeth and you know so we all know when we feel angry how we certain facial expression we see like gritting teeth and so on so that is that is an expressive behavior from the expression you can see this person is an ang in an angry state how do you understand from those expressive behaviors from the body movements and the facial expressions so that is called as expressive behavior and when we feel angry there is an feeling state of enraged you know there is a sense of enraged in your mental experiences you know we we call it is a very hot state you know when you are angry so that means it's a feeling of enragement happens so you feel like you know going or destroying something or like that so that sense of feeling of enragement which is a mental experience uh, that also happens so this example gives you very clearly how what are the aspects of emotions and this is one of the definition that kind of includes very varieties of aspects of emotions in this definition so i think uh, it will be clear through this example so psychologists uh, study uh, all these aspects of emotion okay uh, all these expressive like physiological arousal expressive behavior mental experiences so here you know just to uh, give you an idea so basically you know so there are three components so when you say emotion okay so you you will have so there are three components to it one is physiological so there is some problem so there is a physiological uh, component of it which includes thing like you know uh, heart beat uh, breathing sweating and so on okay. so this is one component whenever we feel emotion so there can be physiological arousal which may include things like heart beat increasing breathing becoming faster sometimes you know uh, uh, people also start sweating and so on so this is one component of emotion so another component is uh, uh, is uh, uh, behavior uh, which includes you know uh, different aspects of behavior that we do in terms of body movement so whenever we feel certain emotions there can be body movements facial expression and so on and then there are third part is called experience or which includes thing like you know sensation how do you feel it in the body and the mind sensation perception everything will be influenced by emotion thoughts memories everything will be influenced etc so this is another component so like this there are three co major components of the emotion 
whenever uh, we experience emotion all these three components will be there. Okay? Now, uh, let us come to the next concept which is very important because these are all basic fundamental concepts we should understand before actually talking about the other theoretical part. So, there are three terms that are used one is effect, emotions and moods. Many times people use these terms interchangeably, but actually these are different technically when we talk about them in the, in the field of psychology. So, effect is a very general term that en encompasses a wide variety of emotions that we feel. So, it is the broadest term effect is a term that is used to connote you know, broadest term used to connote emotions. So, it is an umbrella term which includes no emotions, moods and other everything under it. So, it is the broadest umbrella term called effect. So, this is the broadest term. Then comes emotions. Emotions are intense feeling directed at a person or object. So, generally it is more directed. So, somebody insulted you, insult, no, insulted you and you expressed your anger towards this person. You know. So, it is a very directed, very specific situation oriented feeling. So, that is called as an emotion, it is an intense feeling that happens in the context of a particular person or an object, you know. So, that happens, that is called an emotion. Moods are feelings that, these are also feelings, but generally they lack contextual stimulus. So, generally mood may not have any specific reason many times. So, in emotions, there was a specific person who insulted you and then you know, you express your emotion. Mood may be e without any general context, you may feel bad mood or you may feel good mode, context may be very you know diffused, may not be very specific uh, and uh, moods are generally less intense than emotions because you may feel bad mood throughout the day and so on. So, it may not be very intense, but you know there is a sense of bad mood is there. So, intensity differs. So, will uh, 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 emotion is much more intense than the moods. So, most expert believe that emotions are emotions are more transitory in nature you know the emotion generally comes and goes very uh, very soon so a situation stimulated certain emotion then when situation goes then generally emotion also vanishes so generally they are not very long lasting however mood can be much more long lasting you know you may feel a bad mood whole day so the mood is much more long term in terms of experience so intense feeling of anger may just come and go within few minutes probably uh, or a few seconds whatever it is. However, bad mood can last for hours and even days. Okay. So, in terms of lasting also the mood and uh, emotion differs. So, emotions are a response to a person or event. Generally, it is response to a particular context, person or event. In contrast, moods are not typically focused on certain person or self. Moods are generally it could be without any context. In general, you are feeling something bad or it may be stimulated by something somewhere. But in generally, when you are uh, mood for a bad mood for a long time or a good mood for a long time, those contexts may become irrelevant. Emotions are generally more action oriented, so they are lead to immediate actions. So when you feel emotions, you may when you are angry, you may start go and have a fight or slap someone or somebody. So it may be more action oriented because the intensity is high. Moods are generally more cognitive, no? So at the mental level, you feel bad mood or something, you know. You may brood and think a lot when you are bad mood. A lot of thinking may happen. So they may not be very action oriented, but morely cognitive oriented. So you think more. So this is just a tabular form of form where we are showing what are the what are the difference between emotions and moods. So as we have already discussed, emotions are caused by specific event or persons. Moods may not be caused by anything specific, so the cause may be very unclear in many contexts and may be very more general. You know, we all might have experienced bad mood without any specific reasons, also. Emotions are generally brief in duration, seconds or minutes, okay? generally, you know, they last very short for short duration. Moods generally last longer than emotions, so you we can be in the bad mood for hours and days. Emotions are more specific and numerous in numbers. We can experience multiple emotions like fear, anger, sadness, happiness, disgust. Moods are generally, you know, there is not too many moods. Moods are either good mood or bad mood. Generally, it is one dimensional, uh, you know, two dimensions of this. So, in terms of uh, valence only dimension, positive and negative, generally we experience moods. 
So emotions are generally accompanied by distinct facial expression. So whenever we experience emotion, generally they are associated with specific facial expression. So when you angry, you show certain facial expression. When happy, you show certain other facial expression. So with the changes in the emotion, generally our facial expression also changes. Moods may not be accompanied by such distinct facial expression. Not necessarily moods are you know distinct you know. Uh, facial expression will be accompanied by the mood and emotions are action oriented in nature cognitive uh, and uh, moods are more in cognitive oriented. So, many times both moods and emotion can be connected to each other in, in the sense that emotions can change into mood and uh, mood can also stimulate certain emotions. This is all we have experienced in our life also. So, emotion can change into mood when you stop paying attention to the context that you not know, arrive. So, you might have experienced anger then this if you may not be directly focusing on the situation then anger may lead to bad mood for later late you know experience of bad mood later so it can trigger certain mood certain emotions so emotions and mood can mutually influence each other for example an emotion if it is strong and deep enough can turn into a mood getting your dream job may generate an emotion of joy but it can also put you in a good mood for several days so getting a good job can as an emotion can you know as a joyful emotion can it can start and it can lead to good mood for many days later. So, generally in the theoretically we can make uh, all these distinctions, but in real life sometimes it is not easy to kind of distinguish between uh, when you are experiencing an effect emotions and mood. So, those demarcation may be much more less clear ambiguous in the real life. So, generally here we can kind of draw it like this. So, there is an effect is at the broadest level there is an effect. Okay. So, there is an effect which is the broadest term under this you can have emotions. And moods. So, like this. So, effect is the broadest term which includes emotions and moods, uh, more generalized terms. Emotion is more specific, again, mood is kind of more broader and context free. So, now let us talk about the classification of emotions. So, when we talk about emotions, you know, there are different um, ideas or certain theoretical perspectives to look at emotions. So, one of the uh, very dominant idea in the literature of emotion is that you know, is called the basic emotional model. So, where they try to classify emotion as some emotion is more basic as compared to other emotions. Basic means more fundamental, which are more uh, which cannot be kind of you know further further made into you know fundamental units. So, we all experience diverse emotions, all kinds of emotion, anger, contempt, enthusiasm, fear frustration, disappointment and so on and so on. Some in the uh, uh, researchers who are in the field of emotions, they try to uh, identify or try to classify all these emotions into different categories. One of the idea was to can we kind of find out some emotions which are more basic and fundamental like you know these are all experience experienced by everybody universally across all cultures. So, that is one idea. So, that is the idea of basic emotional model. Some of the prominent psychologists in this field of basic emotions are, are like Paul Ekman, uh, Sylvan Tompkins, Carol Lizard and so on. So, all these people have proposed theories of basic emotions, although they differ in what are those basic emotions, but all these people have proposed uh, certain theories of emotions which are called as basic emotions. With the idea that these have biological underpinnings, there is an evo evolutionary theory perspective and uh, that certain basic emotion evolved and uh, they gave certain numbers of emotions which are called as basic emotions. So, what are the criteria that are used to categorize some emotion as basic emotions? Some of the criteria are like this. One is that these are universal expressions. So, this basic emotion will be universally experienced or expressed in all cultures. They may be expressed in face, you know, in terms of your voice, in terms of body language and so on. All these emotions will have discrete physiology means there will be different physiological markers to them. Uh, they will be present even in some other primates also. So, kind of evolutionarily they have evolved from some animals to humans 
and also there will be an automatic appraisal of evaluation of the environment. So, so all this emotion will be connected to certain kinds of evaluations of the environment. So, whenever you see some danger in the environment, you feel ex you experience fear. So, this is an evaluation of danger is associated with an experience of emotion called fear. So, all this basic emotion will have some appraisal or eval evaluation of the environment as an important aspect to it. So, these are the some of the important criteria on which we can say some whether some emotion is a basic emotion or not. So, there is not yet a consensus on what are those basic emotions, which emotions should be called as basic emotions. So, many researchers have proposed many theories where the number of basic emotions kind of keeps changing with the change of theories. However, one of the uh, most kind of you can say evidence based uh, theory uh, is uh, theory of Paul Ekman who proposed initially proposed six basic emotions. So, these emotions are fear, disgust, anger, surprise, joy, sadness. So, we will see what are these. So, initially he said these are six fundamental or basic emotions that we all experience universally across all cultures. He later included another emotion called contempt contempt as a basic emotion. So, seven basic emotions, six plus one, seven. So, the Paul Ekman's theory uh, talks about seven basic emotions. So, all these emotions have distinct as per the criteria, distinct facial expression. So, if you see all this emotion, there will be distinct, we will talk about those facial expression a uh, little later. All this emotion will have distinct facial expressions, they will be universal and distinctive pattern of physiological response or autonomic nervous system response. Apart from Paul Ekman, other researcher also uh, listed basic emotions such as Tompkins who proposed nine basic emotions and uh, Carol Izzard talked about 10 basic emotions, Robert Plutsky Chick also proposed eight basic emotions. So, they also gave different theories where number of basic emotion basically kept changing uh, and uh, Robert Plutchik theory will be talking uh, in, in this lecture only. So, basically Carol Izzard basically you know talked about 10 basic emotions. So, he included three more emotions in addition to Paul Ekman's theory. He included interest, shame and guilt. Interest, shame and guilt as three more additional emotions in the basic emotional list. And uh, Tompkins used nine basic emotions. He included some newer emotions which are not there in the Paul Ekman's theory. Like he also included uh, something like interest, shame, dismal, distress. Uh, and he did not include contempt, sadness of Paul Ekman's theory. So, these are some of the differences in their theories. Uh, so, the idea is here are there are few changes in those theories which are the basic emotions should be included or not. According to the theory some the, these numbers keeps changing. So, the list of basic emotion is evolving and more may be added as the research progress. So, this is kind of you know still there is no consensus as such what are the basic emotions uh, which should be included. So, these are some the, the, uh, the because Paul Ekman's theory has been researched well researched. So, we will be talking about his seven basic emotions. So, these uh, photographs are taken from the Paul Ekman of uh, his website. These are kind of research stimulus. So, anger you can see here you know it is an um, so generally we experience anger when uh, we are blocked from pursuing a goal. So, whenever we want to reach somewhere and there is a blockage generally we experience anger. Now, it has a very specific facial expression uh, you can see here. So, so, certain uh, you know if you see see certain you uh, know how this face is expressed in anger. So, eyebrows are you can see here you know pull down together, eyes become white. So, here eyes are becoming much more wide open, lips are generally pressed. So, this is how you know some of the specific characteristics of anger as an emotion when people express them and it is generally arises when it is there is a blockage in pursuing a goal or when we are treated unfairly. The next is contempt again it is a feeling of dislike foreign or superiority usually moral superiority over another person or group of people. So, you look down at someone. So, that is a sense of contempt or with a sense of dislike. 
So, here also you can see certain typical facial expression that is expressed by Paul Ekman. So, here it is one corner, one, one side of the face or lip, one side of the lip is generally raised and the tightened and raised lip corner on one side of the face particularly, one side of the lips will be kind of little bit raised. So, that is a typical expression of contempt. Disgust is a emotion that arises as a feeling of aversion towards something offensive. Whenever we see something offensive or we do not like it, so that a sense of disgust arises, sense of aversion arises towards that. So, that as an emotion it is called as disgust. So, here also if you see certain facial expressions, certain typical indicators are there like you know lowered eye eyebrows are lowered here. Uh, there is a wrinkling wrinkles on the bridge between two nose, upper lip is kind of raised, a lower lip is little bit raised and protruded little bit. So, this is also typical facial expression of the disgust. Then comes joy or enjoyment is typically arises from connection or sensory pleasure. So, whenever you feel some sense of pleasure in your life, we experience joy or enjoyment. So, again uh, we all can judge from the face of a person whether the person is joyful or enjoying. Uh, it has also typical facial expression. Eyes are generally narrowed here. You can see here narrowed down and there is a wrinkle around the eyes. So, some wrinkles will be there here. Uh, cheeks are generally raised here and uh, lips are kind of pulled back and you can see the teeth coming out generally or exposed in a smile. So, these are typical facial expression. Fear as an emotion arises whenever we experience threat or harm which could be physical threat emotional threat, psychological, sometimes it could be real threat or even imagined threat. We can experience fear as an emotion. So, uh, fear as an emotion you can see here facial expression is also like here again eyebrows are raised, upper lips is also kind of raised little bit, tense lower eye eyelid kind of jaw kind of dropped open and lips stressed horizontally. So, this is also some typical facial expression of fear. Then comes sadness which results from the loss of someone or something important. Okay? So, whenever we lose something, someone which is very important for us, we experience the emotion of sadness. Now, in sadness again you know uh, if you see the facial expression, so upper eyelid are generally little bit you know kind of uh, dropped little bit looking down most of the time lips cornered are generally you know kind of pulled down a little bit. Inner corner of the eyebrows are also little bit kind of uh, pulled up together. So, that is also another facial expression of associated with the sadness. So, the last one is surprise. It arises when we encounter sudden and un un unexpected things around us. Sounds, movement, whenever something is unexpected happens in our life, then we experience surprise. So, surprise again you see uh, the eyebrows are raised here and they are pulled kind of apart not pulled together. Uh, upper eyelid is again raised here you can see lower uh, this uh, this upper eyelid is also raised and th this becomes kind of neutral like this jaw drop down. So, kind of this is what is uh, typical expression of surprise. So, the next uh, theory of emo basic emotion is also given by Plutchik's wheel of emotion. So, Robert Plutchik created a wheel of emotions in 1980s, uh, 80, which consisted of he talked about 8 basic emotions and 8 advanced emotions each composed of 2 basic emotions. So, basic emotions are 8 and when 2 basic emotions combine they, be, they kind of create something called as an advanced emotions. So, each primary emotion has a polar opposites. So, his theory talks about uh, this eight basic emotion, joy, trust, fear, surprise, sadness, disgust, anger and anticipation. The polar opposite of opposite of joy is sadness, opposite of trust is disgust. So, each emotion will have polar opposites. So, like four are polar opposite of four. So, to, in total it is eight emotions, eight basic emotions. So, if you see joy, trust, fear, so, these 4 and 
these four are polar opposite of this four. So, in total it is four. So, he suggested eight primary emotions composed of four opposite emotional pairs, joy opposite to sadness, anger opposite to fear, trust opposite to disgust, surprise opposite to anticipation and so on. So, half of these are positive emotions and half are negative. So, these are polar opposites. So, he also said that two basic emotions can be combined to form advanced emotion. For example, uh, according to this theory, optimism is an advanced emotions which is formed by anticipation plus joy. So, these are two basic emotions when they combine they form optimism. So, optimism then there is an opposite to each of these advanced emotions, optimism opposite of optimism is disappointment. So, like this he has a list of advanced emotions as well. Each of these advanced emotions are created by combination of two basic emotions. So, advanced emotions like optimism, love, submission, or disappointment, remorse, contempt, aggressiveness and so on. So, you can see all this uh, kind of, I will uh, kind of put all these details in the handouts. Uh, but here you can just have a glimpse of it. So, he gave this diagram or this kind of kind of explain all these complexities of emotions through this diagram. So, here you can see these basic emotions are here joy, trust, fear, surprise, sadness, disgust, etc. So, these eight basic emotions. Now, if you if you go from outside to inside, the intensity increases. So, ecstasy is more intense form of joy, serenity is less intense form of joy. So, as we move from outside to inside, the intensity of each emotion increases. Similarly, in all these cases, trust, acceptance, admiration and so on. So, which is kind of depicted by more, you know, darker shades of the color. Now, here you can see optimism is an advanced emotion. It is, com it is, com it is formed by combination of anticipation plus joy. So, two basic emotions form, combine and they form this advanced emotions. Similarly, love is composed of joy plus trust like this. So, these are all advanced emotions, these are all basic emotions and as we move from outside to inside, the intensity increases. So, this is what this theory is uh, talking about. So, in this figure, emotions with no color represents uh, an emotion that is combination of two primary emotions. For example, love is combination of joy and trust. Uh, I have already talked about the figure shows the intensity as we move from outside to center intensity increases. So, these emotions are related to each other by this spatial displacement. The four emotions are respectively opposed to the other four. So, as we see in this figure, so joy, if you see the opposite here, opposite petal of joy is sadness. So, this is opposite emotions are shown in the opposite petals. So, opposite axis represented opposite emotions. So, when two emotions combine together, they create diet a complex emotion. So, then again there are other complexities is talked about, I will not go into detail of that. So, this combination of diets can be primary when two adjacent emotions like two basic emotions combined. It could be secondary when it is uh, formed by two emotions that are two petals away. So, and, and it could be tertiary when it is three petals away like this. So, I will I'll not go into all these details, but the idea is all this combination can form up to 28 complex human emotions through this model. So, this was kind of a pretty complex model where he tried to see all the possible combinations of emotions which can be uh, experienced in human life. So, one of the basic uh, emotion or the last basic emotion that we will be talking about here is parrot's primary and secondary emotions. So, this is another theory that talks about you know, basic emotions. Uh, in 2000, the parrot is the name of the researcher who classified emotions into primary, secondary and tertiary. So, this classification assert that secondary emotions are derived from primary emotions, whereas tertiary emotions are derived from secondary emotions. So, there is a uh, difference between the earlier theory and this theory. Here, they are saying secondary emotions are derived from the primary emotion, not by the combination. So, that is the different. So, in this approach, secondary and tertiary emotions are derived from the emotions, not as a result of combination. In the other theories, the Plutsky's model shows that you know advanced emotions are composed of two prime combination of two primary emotions. In this case, uh, secondary emotion is derived from the primary emotions and the tertiary emotion is derived from the secondary emotions. So, these are derived not combined kind of emotions. So, Perot proposed a tree like structure showing primary, secondary and tertiary emotion. Uh, it is kind of like this. So, here you can see these are primary emotions love, joy, surprise, anger, sadness and fear. From the love other emotions can arise which are called secondary emotions. 
like affection, lust, longing. So, these are derived emotion from the primary emotion of love. Similarly, there can be a tertiary emotions from each of these three. So, affection may lead to certain other emotion, I will just talk about. Last can lead to some other emotion and longing can lead to some other emotion. So, they, those will be called as tertiary emotions. So, like this you can see here, joy can uh, lead to all these emotions. Surprise generally has no other emotions, uh, other derived emotions. Anger can lead to all this like irritability, expressions, rage, disgust, envy, torment. Sadness can lead to suffering, disappointment, shame, neglect, sympathy. Fear can lead to horror and nervousness. So, like this, these are called, called secondary emotions. So, here just I will just to show how primary secondary. So, if you see fear here, fear let us say is a primary emotions. It can lead to secondary emotion like you know horror, horror and then nervous so this is primary this is secondary and horror can also lead to other emotions like you know alarm it can also lead to shock it can also lead to panic and so on. Nervousness can also lead to suspense, can lead to uneasiness, can lead to worry, distress sorry distress it is not working. So, this will be kind of tertiary emotion. Okay. So, like this you know every emotion primary uh, secondary is derived from prim primary and uh, tertiary is derived from the secondary emotions. So, the detailed list of all these primary secondary and tertiary emotions are given in this table. Uh, you can just look at it and uh, obviously, I will be putting them in the handouts. So, let us see we have looked into some of the important basic theories of emotion, emotions which talks about some basic emotions, some basic universal emotions which are experienced by human being. Now, these theories have some limitations you know that is why you know there are other kind of theories are also there. So, most of the psychologists subscribe to the theory of basic emotions and consider basic emotion as universal innate and hardware. So, that is the idea of basic emotion. These are universal, everybody will experience this sir. These are most like innate and evolutionary and they are hardware in the in our system. Now, the problem uh, some of the limitation that are kind of discussed by uh, theorist is that uh, the theory of basic emotion has yielded significance advances no doubt about it in, in our understanding of emotions, but however, there are certain limitations. One is there is no consensus over the emotions to be included as basic emotions. As we have seen, we have seen three, four uh, theories of basic emotions and each theories talks about different set of emotions even though some emotions are common among all these theories. Uh, but again they differ in terms of which emotions are included as a basic emotions. Then the list of emotions keeps changing with newer research. So, that is another problem with this uh, basic theories of emotion. Then research also demonstrate that people do not perceive or identify emotion as distinct standalone entities. So, many times we do not experience all this emotion as a specific standalone entities in, in many contexts rather more ambiguous overlapping experiences. So, how lot of emotions can become overlapping in terms of our experiences. Let us say some of the unpleasant emotions you know, you know anger can become rage and aggression and so on. So, lot of these emotions are kind of the lack specific boundaries to call them as specifically different emotions. Uh, so, lot of Researcher also argue that this emotion appears to lack the distinct border that could easily distinguish one emotion from another like color spectrum. So, if you see the color spectrum, obviously, there are some specific color, but within those color there are many shades. So, we it is very difficult to many times distinguish you know, among these shades. So, emotions are also like this. So, this is one of the limitations. So, these limitations have been addressed uh, by some other kind of theories 
so we'll uh, uh, talk about another kind of the another theory uh, which kind of try to address some of these limitations so the approach of that theory is very different so these are called as dimensional model of emotions so here the model talks about dimensions of the emotion rather than specifically basic emotions they are talking about so this view claims that emotions are characterized by two or three dimensions so we will correct they are not talking about x y z emotions they are talking about but they are not too much focusing on identifying basic emotions they are talking about dimensions in which emotions can be classified so they talk about two or three dimensions generally in these models they talk about uh, two dimensions one is valence and other is intensity balance basically means balance in terms of pleasant or unpleasant okay so balance means positive balance means pleasant or negative balance means unpleasant and intensity means high or low so in that dimension they kind of talk about emotions one of the most popular theory in this um, category is called as circumplex model is one of the dominant model of dimensional view so we'll talk about this theory a little bit so this circumplex model of emotion was developed by russell james russell in 1980 he talked about these two dimensions in which emotion should be classified one is valence that is pleasure and displeasure positive balance and negative balance another is arousal or alertness which is high and low intensity so this are conceptualized as uh, to be bipolar and orthogonal in nature so let us see what is the basically means so th this was one of the first depiction of this you know circumplex model so this is a dimension where you know arousal is kind of so th this was is arousal arousal dimension so this is high this side is high and here it is low arousal high low this dimension and here it is balance pleasant and unpleasant and you can see in these two dimensions all the emotions can be kind of cut put into in this circle where wherever they are appropriate okay so this is how it is so vertical axis is arousal this horizontal axis is valence here you can see somewhere kind of neutral or medium kind of uh, emotions will be kind of put here so some of these examples of these emotions are shown how it is there no? so here you can see four kind of uh, spaces where we can kind of categorize emotions based on these two dimensions so high activation and unpleasant so this is this is the this is the space where emotions which are high activated both are the intensity high there's a lot of intensity in it and unpleasant in nature are put here so you can see tense nervous stressed upset fear anger disgust so all these are kind of unpleasant emotions but they are also high intensity high arousal level is there activation is very high if you see here it is it is also unpleasant but activation is very low it is low deactivation so person becomes generally lethargic and calm so it includes emotions like sad depressed lethargic fatigued and so on okay so these emotions are unpleasant but deactivated low intensity here you can say it is high activation but very pleasant like alert excited elated happy so all the different aspects of happiness when you become highly activated but these are kind of pleasant and high activation here it is put all the emotions which are pleasant but deactivated these are not very highly activated you become more kind of calm relaxed serene contented so these are four kind of uh, possibilities according to this model so according to russell this model balance and activations are independent bipolar dimension these are all independent and bipolar dimensions balance and activation are unrelated hence they are independent bipolar means that opposite emotional terms reflect each other balance and activation poles so opposite means what in this diagram if you see so this is unpleasant this is pleasant opposite dimension this is high this is low so opposite dimensions so these are four kind of spaces uh, or quadrants in this model we have already to high activation pleasant effect 
high activation unpleasant effect, low activation unpleasant effect, low activation pleasant effect, this four quadrant that we have discussed. So, a linear combination of all these uh, two dimensions or varying level of both the balance and arousal can be used to conceptualize each all this emotion. So, whatever emotion we experience can be put somewhere here in this diagram. So, that is the whole idea of categorizing emotions using these dimensions. So, joy can be conceptualized as a result of strong activation and positive balance. So, we have seen all these examples. So, cognitive interpretation of the neurophysiological experience of arousal and balance within the situational context is contributing factor to categorization. So, how do you categorize emotion x as x and not y? It is all depends on the cognitive interpretation. So, there will be a physiological arousal and there will be a pleasant or unpleasant experience. Then your mind will interpret and give a level to that arousal and, and then and that the balance of it, pleasant or unpleasant. Then you say this is a happy feeling or this is a joy feeling, whatever it is. So, cognitive interpretation kind of labels it. Similarly, uh, between any two affective state is also assumed depend on how far apart from their circles. So, as they differ from, uh, no, uh, in the circle, as they move away from each other, so they are much more different from each other. So, affective state should exhibit increasing negative association with one another in the, so when they become 180 opposite, so generally they will be completely opposite emotions uh, negatively related. So, this model also has some limitations. The two dimensional representation frequently does not convey the significant distinction among various emotions. So, this is again also not able to do justice with all the emotional experiences. For instance, although being positioned in the same area of the circle, similar negative high arousal emotion, for example, fear and anger, they are put in almost in the same position in the circle because both are high arousal, unpleasant emotion. But how do you differentiate them? They will be almost put in the same position. So, those differentiation becomes difficult and they are very distinct emotions. So, that becomes a problem in this kind of model. The model was also developed based on a selection of emotion that was not supported by systematic sampling or explicit theoretical principles. So, both explicit theoretical and systematic research based Nehitao. So, that was also another uh, limitations. This model also however gave widespread acceptance as a meaningful depiction of effect despite these drawbacks. It was very, it, it has been playing very important role uh, in terms of understanding of emotions or at least giving an alternative perspective to basic emotional theories. So, thank you with this uh, I end this lecture. So, in this lecture uh, basically we try to understand some basic concepts, definitions and some basic theories through which we try to understand classification of emotion. Thank you. Mm -hmm.